Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to the February Lunch and Learn series brought to you by Clean Coast Texas, which is a program of the General Land, Land Office. My name is Jenna Walker and I'm joining you from the Meadow Center for Water and the Environment at Texas State University. And I'm going to get this event started in just a few minutes. Well, one minute. All right, so a few housekeeping items first. Please remain on mute. This will really help us with the audio quality and you can uh, keep your video on or off. It's your preference, but please note that this meeting is being recorded and it will be posted for later viewing. Today, we will be, we'll, we will be using the chat fun function to introduce ourselves. So um, please feel free to state your name, your organization, where you're joining us from today, and maybe something that you'd like to learn in this Lunch and Learn today. Um, we will also be using the chat to ask questions and opening up a, a, a Q&A later on. So um, please feel free to add questions throughout the presentation. Get to our agenda. So here's what you can expect today. We'll do a little bit of introductions and then we'll get right into the presentation from Dr. Dorina Mergulet. And then we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A sessions. So again, please use the chat for your questions. We will wrap everything up around 11.55 and then depart by noon. So again, please feel free to introduce yourself, share your name, where you're joining us from, and uh, your organization and maybe something you wanna learn today. Also helping with the Lunch and Learn today from the Meadow Center, we have Sarah Wingfield and she's helping us with tech support. Sarah, do you wanna introduce yourself? Hi everyone, um, I am Sarah Wingfield. I am the communication specialist here at the Meadows Center and I'm very happy to be supporting today. Yeah, and feel free to send her a direct message if you have any issues with the, um, with the presentation. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce you to the, from the Texas General Land Office, Jason Pinchback. Jason? Thank you, Jenna. Good morning, and welcome to another installment of the Texas General Land Office Clean Coast Texas Lunch and Learn series, where we connect with coastal water resources and learn about ways to understand and enhance the management of stormwater runoff. My name is Jason Pinchback, and I'm the Water Resources Manager at the Texas General Land Office under the leadership of Commissioner Don Buckingham. This event is sponsored by the Texas Coastal Management Program, and is intended to be an easy to access forum, removing impediments associated with attending conferences or traveling or long meetings, where we invite subject matter experts to unpack their initiatives into bite-sized morsels, to share ideas that might be useful for neighboring coastal communities to improve local water quality and habitat. Future lunch and learn events coming up this spring and summer will feature economics and water quality by PhD candidate Virgie Greb a deep dive into Galveston Island water quality featuring Drs. Gabrielli Bonatti and Terry Gentry from Texas A&M College Station, and also our very own Lucy Flores from General Land Office who will highlight Texas beach wash initiatives. Clean Coast Texas is here to serve communities by providing local governments, developers, and the general public with information and tools to better manage stormwater quality and its associated runoff. The tools and guidance provided through Clean Coast Texas can help Texas coastal communities implement measures to reduce the impact of development on the environment and protect natural resources that support a thriving Gulf Coast economy. Some of our services include community planning and ordinance development, water quality analysis, and different types of workshops such as green infrastructure, grant development and project management, stormwater retrofit and green infrastructure demonstration projects and other water quality measures. For example, a featured project is currently undergoing permitting in the city of Rockport, where we are creating wetlands alongside Thule Creek 
This is meant to abate sediment and other non-point source pollutants before moving downstream into the treasured Little Bay in the adjacent Aransas Bay. To assist us in the General Land Office of Queen Coast, Texas, and knowing this type of challenge takes a team of well-seasoned and knowledgeable practitioners. The GLO formed a collaborative with Meadows Center for Water and the Environment at Texas State University, with Texas Community Watershed Partners at AgriLife Extension Service, and Texas Sea Grant at Texas A&M. Today, I'd like to thank uh, Sarah Wingfield and Jenna Walker of Meadows Center for Water and the Environment for co-hosting and providing technical support for the Lunch and Learn event. Today's feature presentation is provided by Dr. Dorena Morgalette. Dr. Morgalette began her career as a research hydrogeologist at the Geological Survey of Alabama while pursuing her PhD at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. Her PhD work focused on groundwater flow dynamics and contaminant transport to coastal water under low recharge conditions, specializing in groundwater surface water interactions within the land water continuum. Her work improves our understanding of coastal groundwater dynamics and their impacts on coastal marine ecosystems. I began working more formally with Dr. Morgalette back in 2019 when she joined our ad hoc working group investigating a widespread bacterial contamination event that spanned 60 miles of coastline, two counties, and lasted for nearly three months. That investigation found no substantial bacteria loading from stormwater runoff or upland flows from rivers or streams, malfunctioning wastewater treatment plants, wildlife, or other plausible sources. Through an extensive process of elimination exercise, theories developed about interactions between groundwater, concentration of habitable structures, and nearshore environs. Soon after that event subsided back in 2019, Dr. Morgalet assembled a team of groundwater, water chemistry, and microbiology experts and applied for CMP funding to investigate and bring insights to important coastal forces impacting nearshore water quality. She is here today to share some of that information with us. So today's presentation is part two of the special multi-part series. We featured Dr. Morgalet a few months back in part one was a tutorial on shallow groundwater and surface water and beach interactions. We'll post a link for that in a few minutes, as well as our menu of services. Without any further ado, let's welcome Dr. Morgalette. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'll uh, share my screen now. Um, I think Jenna, okay, there you go. My work now, yes. I'll let you know when we see it. Okay. Is it on? It is on in your presentation mode. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for um, attending this, uh, this seminar today. Um, I appreciate you being interested in this topic. Um, and for those of you coming back and um, wanting to learn more about the interaction between groundwater and surface water in coastal areas and the impact it has on the uh, water uh, contamination or the water quality. Today we'll uh, dive a little bit deeper into the concept of water table flooding and um, uh, coastal uh, contamination. So with that said, I would like to um, acknowledge my postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Narimani, who worked tireless on, on uh, this presentation and she's um, helping with the deep data analysis of our projects, as well as my collaborators, Dr. Felix with the Center for Water Supplies here at Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, and Dr. Kapoor from uh, UTSA. I also want to um, move forward on my slides. Okay, sorry, acknowledging my group uh, through time, but they are the, the ones doing all the field work and, and the lab work and uh, the data analysis, um, the Center for Water Supply Studies wouldn't be able to conduct the research uh, we are uh, today if we didn't have the support of our students and um, our um, full-time staff. So uh, very briefly, I'll um, do a, a little bit of introduction of, of our topic, uh, water table flooding, um, diving into the relationship that, uh, to the study area where we're focusing uh, today and uh, brief methodology, some preliminary 
uh, well, results and some preliminary conclusions, and then we'll uh, have the Q&A section. As Jenna said, um, feel free to ask questions throughout my presentation in the Q&A or the chat session. Okay, so uh, last time um, I have talked about a, little, a lot more about the hydrologic cycle and um, it's changed and updates through time. Um, but today, just very briefly, very brief, briefly a reminder, I'm sorry, um, that groundwater is a big part of the water cycle. In other words, precipitation infiltrating into the ground becomes groundwater flow and um, uh, flows towards where the aquifers are connected to the surface water bodies and uh, in, to the coast. So with that, we have to keep in mind that connection between the groundwater and the surface water that's driven by multiple factors, including terrestrial gradients when the groundwater elevation is higher than the sea level or tidal uh, dynamics, higher tides or lower tides, and that coastal uh, dynamic influence, as well as uh, the precipitation and um, and recharge from precipitation or from rivers and lakes. So we're talking, we're we're hearing the term coastal flooding a lot, and uh, most of the time you we we just think about storm surges and the coastal flooding caused by storm surges. However, today we'll bring in this uh, other component, which is groundwater, and how that might relate to the coastal flooding. So let's introduce the water table. I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, everyone is familiar with that, but um, the water table is the very first layer of saturated formation sediments, in our case, um, um, consolidated sediments like sand, silts, um, under our feet to where if we start digging a hole, we are going to find those four spaces between sediments filled with water completely. So if you look at this diagram here, and I hope everybody can see my, my arrow um, moving, but uh, we it's very it's a very dynamic, um, aquifer in terms of connection to surface water bodies as well as precipitation. So in a normal year uh, with a normal precipitation, uh, we have what we expect generally to find the depth to groundwater table. And in a drought, we'll expect to find it much lower and an extreme drought even further down. And that is when we're, we're expecting the streams to, to lose water to groundwater, uh, but and that also when wells will run dry, right? Completely dry. In any case, the water tab table uh, tends to be a replica of the groundwater, of the ground elevation. And so you see that in higher lands, it's a little bit deeper to the groundwater. As you get closer to a surface water body, it's much closer to the to the ground surface. Now let's let's go a little bit further away from um, from the coast and to include a more regional perspective of a groundwater flow system and the interaction with the coast. So groundwater recharge regionally uh, happens in higher land. So precipitation infiltrating into the ground raises the water table. In also this higher lands is where groundwater loses to um, recharges the streams. And that's because groundwater is more elevated than the streams. But as the streams are flowing towards the coast, they're gaining more and more water. So it's they could be generally higher levels than the groundwater elevation. So at those, those locations closer to the coast, sometimes ground, um, the rivers are recharging the groundwater. And this happens after storm events in general, uh, we'll have times so of higher recha groundwater recharge periods from the streams and, and creeks. But also we see that there is a regional pattern of flow of the groundwater. So going from the recharge and higher groundwater elevation towards 
C because the C is the lowest elevation. So groundwater flows from higher elevation to lower elevations. Well, what we're seeing in this example, we're looking at a lagoon. So, and we can uh, imagine this being our barrier islands. Um, we see that there is exchange with the bad lagoons as well as there is exchange further down at the beach face with the uh, sea or the Gulf of Mexico in our case. It is also important to note that while a local exchange exists, longer, more regional exchanges also occur. And also they impact the water table further downstream. As you see here, it's slightly higher also because of topography, but also because the, there is a push of groundwater that's moving regionally towards the Gulf. So when looking at uh, water table flooding, we should consider both storm surges and what you see on your right side here, um, as the tides are higher and the water is moving over the coast, you'll have that portion where it's flooding from the surface, but we also expected that it will be impact going in through the um, sediments and raise the water table, as well as when it rains and the water table goes high and the um, groundwater um, gradients are steepening towards the coast, then you do have more, more push from runoff, surface runoff, but also more of that more regional or within the watershed um, groundwater input that can lead to flooding in the lower laying areas. Looking closer at the storm surge and the relation with sea level, uh, if we start with the blue line here in this uh, cross-sectional uh, diagram, um, we'll see that uh, while we have still this marine inundation for even when the sea level is, is lower. Um, the water table is much lower below the ground surface. As the sea level goes up, you will see also a, an increase in the water table. And now the areas that are lower elevation will be inundated by groundwater. So just to put in perspective, both um, factors impacting um, inundation in coastal areas. Last time we uh, introduced the impact uh, that this water table fluctuation and dynamics and connection with surface water, which the sea and the coast, um, it has on the septic systems. Uh, They're very close to the shorelines. And that again, it's not going to, to be impacted by the higher sea level, but also by the higher water table that might be driven by the higher hydraulic gradients in land. So just to remember a septic system um, that has um, the septic tank collecting the waste where the sewage and the, um, the sewage is separating from the solids and it's pushed into a drainage field that, that's supposed to put, allow that sewage to filtrate through a portion at least three feet by EPA requirements of dry soils. There are not extremely permeable because the water will flow very, very fast, will um, move downwards very fast, not allowing enough filtration of the contaminants, but not very low permeability either. And in other words, not clay because it doesn't drain and you have the piling up at the surface. So we also looked at this uh, image here with a different with different situations in terms of ground water, ground elevation, uh, a constant water table where all the systems are working properly. They have enough drainage field uh, drainage um, coverage below the drainage field, and then the the situation with a higher water table where. The one in the higher ground elevation, it's still working properly, but the, the ones closer to the water table are now compromised and failing because uh, they're partially submerged. So how do we see this? Um, if, you, if you 
think you have that problem, you could just dig a hole in your backyard and, and you might hit water and see how close that to the surface is. You might be able to see uh, also should look at the type of soils that are there. If they're very clay, most likely it's not going to work very well for drainage. But also if you have a very um, close to the surface water table, your lines are backing up, probably sewage lines as well as the, the drainage fields are being flooded and so not, nothing filtrating. So uh, it's common too that uh, because of the water table creeping up and if you build in a lower um, area, you might be seeing it flooding from uh, the basement. Um, we see this in the field in our area. So this is a picture uh, from about two weeks ago up on around Surfside, I believe, either Freeport or, or Surfside on the beach uh, at a very, very low tide. Um, this holes on the beach that uh, probably tourists or people dug beforehand were filled with water and the entire beach was very, very wet. So of course we, because we sample poor water too, we're looking at what's under the um, top of the, of the ground. Um, the salinity in this hole and in the pour was three. To put that in perspective, the average salinity of seawater is 35. So that was nearly uh, fresh. That tells us there was a lot of fresh water coming into and moving into the Gulf. Um, also, sorry, delayed on that. So that's the, the near shore seepage, diffuse seepage that we see in our, in our coastal area. Um, other uh, patterns that we saw where water was draining are these shapes here that you see um, coming from holes on the beach, which we look back and they are um, what we found by taking some uh, some cores, they are the ghost streams that uh, one of my graduate students is very fascinated about. And uh, she, in her studies, she found that they could dig holes down three, well, I'll go from meters to feet here, nine to 10 feet deep into the ground. And they're creating these networks, connected networks of, of holes, channels, and so it seems like these holes were filled with water that was pushed out and was trying to drain towards the Gulf. Um, so it's it's very fascinating to see that. It's just to mention that um, the same time the the um, upstream there was a river flooding warning. So that's you know bringing all these aspects together. Lower tide, uh, high stream flow discharge uh, inland. So. For our study area, we're focusing um, on uh, barrier islands, which are um, dynamic like landforms, as we, we all know. Um, they're um, acting as natural defense barriers to storm surges and to coastal erosion. They are very permeable sediments, usually sands and silts. And they're, they're formed from the sediments that was deposit deposited by ocean currents ways and tides that's brought in by rivers or erosion, uh, inland erosion, and uh, reworked um, other coastal formations. Uh, what is important to note is that barrier islands are, while they are surrounded by water on both sides, right? Um, the, the flood uh, tidal delta here or navigation channels and the, the sea on, on the other side, they're still connected to the mainland. Okay, as going into the ocean too, we're still connected to the mainland. So they have that connection to the um, regional hydraulics, hydrogeology. Um, so diving into our study area, we have uh, covered Matagorda, Brazoria, and Galveston, as Jason said, and we looked at, we installed about 12 monitoring wells uh, which were we've sampled for 18 months uh, each month uh, on Galveston Island here is where we're going to talk a little bit more today. Uh, there are about four monitoring wells. Um, none of them are within the city limits. Um, forward. So uh, besides these monitoring wells that we installed along the shore, at, along the Gulf, we also are looking at 
the groundwater monitoring wells from the Texas Water Development Board uh, further inland, which are in red here, um, as well as the tide stations, because uh, we want to see how the sea level is changing, and stream flow discharges within the watershed. So sampling every month of groundwater or water near the shore and uh, where we're collecting the surface water sample as well in the Gulf of Mexico. We're also collecting samples from the discharge uh, channels or, or what, whatever is coming into the Gulf to constrain that um, surface water input, uh, as well as um, the wells. Every month for 18 months, uh, we are measuring um, groundwater tracers as um, radium and radon, which are uh, derived from the uranium, the sediments in the ground, they're rich in uranium and thorium minerals. And so they're, um, they're enriched in groundwater, but they're in very small amounts uh, in surface water. And when we find that in sig more significant um, levels, we know that we have higher contribution of groundwater. And we can calculate usually an estimate of how much groundwater input there was. We're also measuring different uh, species of nitrogen and um, stable isotopes of nitrate and enterococci and uh, the fecal genetic markers for human, bird, and dog. As far, we, we need to understand what's going on with uh, recharge to the aquifers and the stream flow and therefore precipitation is essential because we're spanning over a larger area and the uh, precipitation gauge stations are not located necessarily near where we're looking at along the, the Gulf. We're using the global precipitation measurement data, which is uh, giving us um, every 30 minutes precipitation rates that are spatially distributed. So here you see an example going from uh, November 26 in 2021, the same date in 2022, the same date in 2023, uh, with the highest uh, precipitation uh, amounts in the lighter white going to the green where it's the lowest um, amount. We're I'm showing you this very busy graphs, not that we try to discuss this now, but just to show you the tidal data record, how busy and noisy that is. Uh, but there are some daily fluctuations. They're pretty extreme that we're seeing in, in those. Uh, the stream flow nearby, um, in this case, is the Tres Palacios. Um, that's showing a lot of variability as well through time from 2021 January to uh, almost the end of the year 2023. And we kind of see a pretty uh, big drop here towards the end of the record. I just wanted to keep in mind how dynamic these factors are that we discussed already as potentially influencing our, um, our results. So with all of that, we have to find ways to determine what is causing the groundwater fluctuation. And if there is any connection with the tides, with the precipitation, with the further ground, groundwater elevations in land um, or any other factors, there is, because they all play a role, it is difficult to just go with the typical statistical analysis that we used to doing and correlation. So, we're diving into the data science with the use of um, machine learning um, here that we are trying to determine trends in the in the each parameter, uh, which variables are connected, um, how are they connected? So we can then involve all the different factors uh, into our, um, correlations to try to identif identify factors that are playing a role. So now we can, um, we're going to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in, in this uh, area in relation to the Galveston, um, to the Galveston Bay and, and Galveston Island. And Again, very, very busy graphics, but the point that I'm trying to make here is, so for instance, if we're looking at 2023 between January 
to December. Uh, the blue is the precipitation at a precipitation gauge station nearby uh, that area. Then the green is the stream flow discharge. The tides are the very busy ones going up and down. And groundwater elevations in monitoring wells from Texas Water Development Board, they're close to the Galveston um, Bay, a little bit upstream. Um, just taking just the tides and doing some uh, normalization of the, of the data so we can compare them closer. And the groundwater elevation in one of those monitoring wells close to the Galveston Bay, what we're seeing is that there's some trends, that they're following similar patterns. We definitely see that those uh, tidal fluctuations are being projected into the groundwater, which is in red here. Uh, but we also see that there is a shift. They're not all aligning. So, which means that there is a lag time. There is a something, the, let's say the um, groundwater elevation increased after some time after the tide went up, right? So in this case, we're finding that the best correlation between those two parameters happens at 7.5 hours, not at the same time. Why am I, I'm trying to make this point? Because when we're going in the field and we're sampling and we're taking groundwater elevation we're, or we're taking, we're looking at the tide at the time we're, we're taking the sample, that is not necessarily, and then we're measuring the chemistry, that chemistry is likely not to be the result of what was there at that moment in terms of hydrology. So zooming into our own monitoring wells on, on the Galveston Bay Island, and just in 2022, between January to March, um, the four monitoring wells we have though there are uh, the purple, orange, uh, brown here. The monitoring well that's further inland from Texas Water Development Board is in green. This is discharge, stream flow discharge that we looked at before. And these are the tides in blue up here. So what we're seeing is that although there is a lot of noise that is tide related in the groundwater elevations, those are very small changes. The largest changes in groundwater elevation happen um, outside those. This is a big jump here and another one that we are not necessarily correlating, we're not correlating it with the tides. It might be the precipitation played a role there. And that's something that we're looking into uh, next. But then paying attention to this big increase, jump in and in, in stream flow discharge. And when the highest groundwater elevations are found is happening to coincide also with the highest tides too but the highest uh, stream flow discharge is also overlapping. And then as the stream flow discharge is going down, so is the groundwater elevation with different responses, even spatially within that barrier island. As you can see, we have different responses to uh, in the groundwater elevations. So then with that in mind, what you're looking at here is the variability in stream flow, which are the bars, here, um, between 2021, when we started monitoring, 2021, November uh, and December, then going into 2022, orange, and then 23, green, and looking at the mean bacteria levels that we measured in groundwater there. What we're seeing is that where lower uh, in January, for instance, let's just take January, February, March, because those are the ones where we looked at in 2022 at the groundwater changes um, and being so much higher with the stream flow, we see a lower stream flow with a higher bacteria, mean bacteria in January, but in February, higher stream flow with higher bacteria. And the same for March. So recall that this, were, this was the, the time period where we had that high peak in the stream flow and where groundwater levels went up. 
And so there is a lot of variability too, and there are different trends. But again, remember, we're just looking at mean stream flow, mean bacteria. Also, just looking at the stream flow and bacteria alone is not helping. The tide, taking the tide, we, we also see that uh, in January, lower tide in, um, in 2022 is higher bacteria, but then higher tide range in February we had higher bacteria, but previously with the stream flow that was corresponding with higher stream flow. So what do we what do we have to do and what we're doing to, to try to get to where we better understand this and be able to predict which factors are playing more of a role uh, in the occurrence of bacteria in groundwater and then further into the surface water along the, the Gulf. In this example, you see a cluster analysis, which does what? It groups the different parameters and variables that we're looking at, like stream flow discharge and groundwater elevations by common futures. So for instance, stream flow going up, groundwater went up. Um, and so if we're looking at this, we're seeing, for instance, that this discharge, the stream flow is connected to all of this here, but further into this groundwater elevations that are from Texas Water Development Board monitoring wells. This is just an example of how do we know how do we know which stream flow location to choose in our analysis that's influencing? That we're not going further away from where that regional flow in hydrology is outside, outside its boundaries. Further, to look at parameters that we're measuring in the field and how they might relate to bacteria, we're going to have to identify trends. And so this is a very busy graph again uh, to the left, but is showing us that they tend to, to follow similar trends while they have this lag effect. In other words, one is leading the other or it's showing up after a certain time. This is just a preliminary predictive model that we tried uh, with raw data, meaning there is no transformation, no normalization, uh, no lag effect included, that is showing that stream flow discharge is the best predictor for us for bacteria in that, in that Galveston um, barrier um, island that's explaining some of the highest occurrences of bacteria in groundwater. Again, this is very preliminary. It's just showing you some results so far. Now, moving into the, what the markers are showing, the human, bird, and dog fecal genetic markers. Um, these plots are cumulative, meaning every occurrence is summed up uh, per with time. For the period of time we studied um, that area, we stopped in May 2023 started in November 21. You, you can see that in groundwater, poor water, surface water, the uh, bird marker is predominant. Um, the dog or animal marker is also showing up in green in, in groundwater, which is uh, really interesting. Uh, in poor water, this is in the Gulf. Remember, this is in the Gulf in the sediments, the water that we extract from the sediments and in the surface water, but the human marker shows up in January, March in groundwater. Remember that was the time where we saw that high peak in the stream flow. Uh, it's showing up toward the, towards the end of the year in 2022 again, in uh, November and December, and again in February, 2023. And in surface water is a lot more prevalent um, towards the end of the year going into uh, May. This is in 2023. It's been pretty predominant there, um, as well as it was um, earlier in 2022 for some months. So this is concerning because this uh, the presence of, of human fecal bacteria is the, has the, the highest health risk. Um, I said that we're measuring nitrogen for nitrogen species and we're measuring the um, uh, stable isotopes, which are 
ways to fingerprint the source of the, of the nitrogen. Why are we doing this? When a septic system fails to function properly, we expect to find bacteria accompanied by high levels of nitrogen, um, sometimes in the form of ammonium, sometimes in the form of nitrate. If it's in the form of ammonium, it means that it, there was no filtration time, no time for uh, ammonium to be converted to nitrate. Um, studies have looked at the differ, different signatures of these different types of sources of nitrogen. So what you see here in these graphs are fields. There are a pretty wide range of, for instance, what the um, nitrogen nitrate fertilizer looks like in terms of the oxygen 18 ratio versus nitrogen 18. Then the ammonium fertilizer, the soil nitrogen, the manure and septic system is in this field as is the, the marine source, okay? In this case, pore water in red, surface water in green, and groundwater in blue here, the triangles, we see that they overlap quite a lot. And that's an indication there's a lot of interaction with the sources. There's also processing of that, of the, that nitrogen. Um, and there isn't enough time for me to dive into this and really get, do it justice, but there is this means removal of nitrate to de, to denitrification by uh, denitrifying bacteria or other means. Um, it also shows that we are at the higher end here of of uh, manure and septic waste, uh, or have some little bit of mixing with the nit nitrate fertilizer or nitrogen deposition. But we also have to look at is th these samples that fall under or move forward, further away through processing might be just marine sources. And so we have to dive deeper in to look at how high those concentrations were, because we know what we should expect naturally to occur in marine um, environments. And with that, I wanna thank you all for your attention and uh, bearing with me to go through this presentation. Um, any questions, please um, let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Murgulet. Uh, that was a fascinating presentation. And I'll have to admit, at least for myself, uh, I think uh, I'll be steeping on a lot of that information and, and definitely look forward to, to reviewing uh, the PowerPoint as well afterwards. So thank you. Um, Absolutely. With, given you know, you've been working on this topic for, for a while and you have this multidisciplinary team, um, were there some expectations you had going into this project that uh, kind of got blown out of the water or reaffirmed as you've been moving through and looking at the data? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, the theory was more so um, that the tides were going to have the highest impact. And we're not ruling that out, right? Because Jason, you mentioned at the beginning when we looked at the issues uh, back in 2019, uh, it was dry weather load related. So it wasn't rain, it was not high flow um, stream dis discharge, uh, but a very, very long period of a high, extremely high tide, right? So that we have not yet captured in, in our time frame because we started later. Um, and hopefully through more monitoring, we can do that. But what we're seeing, and, and then we're thinking precipitation, but more so local precipitation on the Barrier Island than more regionally. I think what we're starting to see, because stream flow, one could think stream flow could be just more surface runoff, right? More surface uh, sources from the surface uh, water. But to, to us, it also means recharge to the aquifers. And because these stream flow gauges are further inland, they don't, it's, it's the 7.5 days might not make sense that that source will make it down there. Um, we, we think that we now have to look deeper into the watershed, further up into the watershed and connect the hydrology a lot better. Wow, that's interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, just as a reminder to folks, uh, feel free to please use the chat function to provide uh, questions and comments. And I'd like to turn it over to Jenna Walker to see if we have some to bring bring forward. Yes, I see one in the chat, but y'all don't be shy and 
um, comments are also welcome. So the one question is, will the oversaturated soils cause problems for land for, for foundations and impact property values negatively along the South Padre Barrier Island? And then there's a second question with that, how does one mitigate the effects of, of sinking foundations if soils are too saturated? So if we're talking about just barrier, the barrier islands and not talking about further inland, um, those are, um, because they're, they're sandy, they're pretty, um, they're not compacting that easy, right? So a lot of the times we see that soil, the, 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 the clays are shrinking and, and swelling. If it's very dry, they'll shrink. So then we see the cracks and the, and the um, sidewalks and uh, the cracks in the foundations. Um, and that's a lot more impactful than if you were in an area where you have sands because the sands are pretty stable and they're not moving a lot with, um, with the water table going up and down. Now the damage that that would do to, I don't know, pipes that are buried in there, I, I can't speak for that. I think we, we saw I think it was 20, sometimes soon, you know, we didn't, the pandemic just gave me a, <laughs> I can't relate back to when we had a lot of rain here in Corpus Christi and uh, the water table was very high on our um, island here and the ditches were full with water and there was a back uh, flow on, you know, when you're flush, flushing your toilets um, and that's because of that water table going up. So I think it's generally not common that we have foundations and barrier islands. We should have these homes up on piers just to be safe. But um, I wouldn't, I, I would, you know, with sea level going up or more extreme precipitation events we're getting, there's going to be a lot of unknown, but of what that would do to, to the economic value of homes. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Okay, well, uh, another comment was that some correlations were are intuitive and others surprisingly not so much. Do you have any response to that? Well, uh, absolutely, some are intuitive and that's where we yeah. <laughs> we use our you know knowledge and, and we think like when talking with Jason in 2019, like it's very intuitive to me that if the sea level goes up, the water table will go up. Um, it's just that um, others are not, didn't really expect to see an impact, so much of an impact from inland, whatever happens inland. So we really, intuitively, we would have looked at precipitation along the barrier island, right? We would have looked at the tides, but we, um, what we don't know is what happens regionally and we don't know which direction groundwater flows either to, to impact and where this is going to be more impacted uh, because subsurface is so complex. Um, and, you know, so that, that, is, that is one, but also just because the water table goes up and you have more recharge, some dilution might happen too. And, so, and that's also uh, to what extent it is, it's very difficult because these homes are, uh, not they don't always have people living in there. So sometimes you don't have inputs because nobody flushes the toilet in there, right? Uh, sometimes you have more people doing so. Is the is is it that what happened at that time the result of one or the other or all of those factors together? That is where it's not intuitive anymore, right? It's a little it's a little difficult to um, draw the conclusion. Yeah, I really liked your visual showing all the different arrows and really how mm -hmm. how complex it is. Another question, how do bacteria present in the water table get down into the confined aquifer below, which could then allow them to be discharged offshore? Oh, no, really if I if I uh, implied that uh, then I will I will have a chance and I appreciate it giving me the opportunity to correct that. Um, no, it's about localized, really localized, those localized flow paths. So I could um, go back here for a minute. 
to the diagram. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Right here. So not, not thinking that this will infiltrate and go into the deeper aquifer and go further like that. It's really more of what's going on right here and, and right here. In the process, if there is leaching from those septic uh, fields into the water table, it will mix with this groundwater and, and transport it laterally rather than I expect it to be transported vertically into the deeper aquifers. Um, I don't know if that uh, answered the question, but there is a lot of mixing of different flow paths. And that, as a matter of fact, makes it extremely difficult for us to even say with certitude that because we didn't see it at one location, it's not there. We should have a very high um, intense, well, you know, a lot of monitoring wells in one area that we would be sampling to be able to determine and find the different paths that that contamination can take. And I can, I can give you an example of uh, those uh, drainage or, or drainage fields that you have in some of these areas. So take, take for instance, um, Surfside. There are some, those ditches that go into the channel before they go into the Gulf. And that is where water table drains into. So we're, we're gonna start looking into that a little bit closer because they might not actually follow a flow path that we expected just because of how different the sediments are within the subsurface, where that lower gradient might be. You have active flow maybe through the channel that's gonna pull more of the groundwater in that direction rather than allowing it to go directly to the Gulf. So um, again, it's, it's really intuitive, but not always. Okay, um, another question. When you were on Follett's Island Surfside with the holes full of water that had low salinity, did you investigate mm -hmm. any possible breaks or clogs in the local municipal drinking water system? No. No, that that would be that would be a lot <laughs> if that's uh, if that's the case. That would be a, a a big loss for the city if they're losing their water. But no, we're we're going to see we're going to have to look for patterns and and try to find the explanations. Um, if we are seeing that, for instance, stream flow comes up a lot in our record as explaining higher water table, then uh, we know that that probably was a relation, the relationship there. But it's also, again, kind of intuitive because we had a lot of rain um, leading up to that event. So um, it's also very possible that, um, and I didn't look at what the salinity in the wells was, but it's probably pretty low as well. So a lot of recharge locally happened as well. But it's a good point. And that's something that it's important to look for, and I'm wondering if I can get that information. So if anybody in the audience is thinking about that and has that information, I'll be so grateful if you share that. Team effort. Absolutely. Okay. Another question. What would be the role of the paleofluvial channels underneath the barrier islands in the data you are collecting? And can they act as local groundwater reservoirs influencing the water table? Yeah, it's 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 possible. Again, it has to be a connection between the water table and those uh, those futures underground. So, um, if there is enough information for us to make a connection, but we are not monitoring deeper either, so we're not monitoring anything that's connected to those um, geologic futures. Um, Again, if there is a connection and there is transport and movement of water, then um, that's possible. There is a connection, but I don't. I'm not sure about it. I haven't looked into that or that deep. As we are uh, going to start looking into the radium isotopes closer, uh, where we should be able to determine how much of that water is might be coming directly from the water table as we have a signature in the water table versus how much might be coming from um, other sources like the deeper um, or 
teachers like that. So, but I know that 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 brings in a level of uh, heterogeneity. So I didn't want to go too technical into this. There are areas where there might be connection and there are areas there might not be connection because of the different uh, type of the positional environments. Okay, great. Uh, we are at time, but we have one one last que question from my colleague, Dr. Aris Mendez here at the Meadow Center. So maybe if you could just briefly answer this before Jason wraps up. Have you considered using tracers to help with water movement, such as salinity, dyes, optical brighteners, et cetera? Oh, salinity, we are measuring it. Uh, but the those kind of tracers don't really work that well in this kind of environments because all of the they work very well in, in karst aquifers or fractured formations because you have channelized flow. Uh, sometimes you are able to know but even there is really complex. Um, putting dye in, for instance, a well here or in a ditch where we see that there is sewage and waiting for that to come somewhere, um, it's it's just where? <laughs> That's the question. Where where are you going to run after and try to, to monitor it? Uh, it's quite intensive too and um, we know that sometimes we have to sacrifice, so for instance, time resolution for spatial resolution. So this effort has been quite a lot as running up the down up and down the coast, trying to do the surface water, the groundwater, the pore water. But with that, knowing how complex flow paths can be and so unpredictable, um, I, I don't know that it would work. It's not that well and were applied in unconsolidated sediments. But please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm open to discussion, very Thank open. You. Thank you so much. I will hand it back to, to Jason to close our Lunch and Learn today. Thank you so I'll much, Jenna. Dorena, uh, a couple of things are quite remarkable with the information that you're sharing here is that while you, you have a, a ton of information, a lot of insights, uh, there's still so much yet to learn. And, and these kind of laser beam spotlights into the data and information still leave a lot of room uh, in the periphery that's not being looked at uh, to still focus on and collect information as we begin to scratch at the surface to understand what's going on. It, we, we have, um, we're kind of trailing along some areas of Florida that have experienced some similar issues uh, with water quality and nearshore wa water flooding. And so we continue to learn from them and we wanna to continue to learn from you and your team and look forward to uh, some publications and uh, once, once you wrap up your project and seeing that. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you for having me. And again, anybody that's thinking about anything that um, we could use and, and collaborate, I'll, I'll please reach out. I'll be happy to have a conversation. Folks, please mark your calendars for March 21st, 11 a.m. We have our next Lunch and Learn featuring, featuring GLO's Lucy Flores to talk about Texas Beach Watch. This recording and the presentation will be sent out in the next few days by Texas State University. I'd like to thank my co-host, Jenna Walker, as well as Sarah Wingfield, for helping us uh, facilitate today's event. I'd also like to thank our Clean Coast Texas collaborators, Texas Community Watershed Partners, and Texas Sea Grant for helping us do great things with communities. Please keep in touch. Have a wonderful day.